Time to get started, page 531 in your hymn book. 531. More and more about Jesus. Five thirty one. Let's stand together as we sing. More about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to ever show. More his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving fullness see more his love who died for me more about Jesus let me learn more of his holy will discern spirit of God my teacher be showing the things of Christ to me more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more about Jesus in his word holding communion with my Lord hearing his voice in every line making each faithful saying mine more more about Jesus more more about Jesus more of his saving for Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. That's a good song. Page 513. 513. This song, usually when it's sung, it's sung for an invitation. But an invitation is always in order, isn't it? To follow the Lord wherever he leads. 513. <clears throat> Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take thy cross and follow, follow me, where he leads me
That's what Brother Peter said too, didn't he? He said, Lord, I'll go to death with you. And he didn't do it. But boy, I like the song. This is an old, old song, I bet. And a long time since I've sung it. Let's sing all three verses on the second one. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him with him all the way he will give me grace and glory he will give me grace and glory he will give me grace and glory and go with me with me all the way where he leads me i will follow where he leads me i will follow where he leads me i will follow i'll go with him with him all the way he leads me I will follow I remember visiting a kibbutz in Israel is on the west bank off in the distance you could see that wall that Israel built to separate them you know from the from the Palestinian territories and, and I was just walking around in the kibbutz it's kind of a communal farm and I looked across the hills down in the valley and saw this big flock of sheep going up the valley and, and you know they over there they, they're not like quite pretty things they're kind of dirty dingy gray brown things but I looked and, and I noticed something that at first glance it seemed strange I noticed all them sheep and one person out in front walking he wasn't behind them sheep driving them like you do cows he was out in front walking and they were following him and that's the picture of the shepherd and his sheep and where he leads I'll follow because I'm I'm just one of the flock of his sheep ain't that beautiful say amen <laughs> now you can be seated. <laughs> if you didn't say amen, you couldn't sit down. <laughs> Let's look at our prayer request tonight. We have a, a considerably long list. And as we always do, we're going to call them out each and every one. As we're going through these, do you ever see a name and you just think, boy, I wonder what their story is. I wonder what their life is. I wonder what their need is. And most of them we just don't know, do we? But their names have been put on this prayer slip right here, and somebody said, would you pray for them? And so that's why we usually pray, Lord, whatever your will, may it be fulfilled in their life, because we don't know. 
But we can sure call out their names to the Lord. Pray for the Garrett family. Jim and Sherry Foshi, Jack and Jerry Jones, Journey Davis, Leslie and Bryant Jones, Jalen Jordan and Jeff Babb, Emilona Bobadilla. I, every time I read that name, I wonder about her story. And I think you all told me one time, tell me. So she's like a five, six-year-old girl with cancer. Mm -hmm. It makes you want to pause there a minute when you read her name, doesn't it? Pray for Nancy Bible, Rick and Jamie, the Thacker family, Pam Bowman, Mike Leonard, Jaretta Bucket, Beckett for difficult students. Surely not. <laughs> not in this day and time, teachers don't have difficult students. Were you a difficult student? I see one over there. I can tell just by looking at him. <laughs> Did you, you remember uh, when, when we were difficult students, you know, they would take you out in the hall uh, and they had a big old board <laughs> and they'd just give you a few swats with the board. And that worked real well as long as it was embarrassing, you know, to have to get that. But when it become a badge of honor to see who could get the most, and it kind of defeated its purpose, didn't it? Those were the difficult students. I thought, I've had five this week. How many of you had? Those are the difficult students. We, of course, you can't do that anymore. Even you can. The print, does the principal still do that? Right. Well, see, you're you're in the hills of Northeast Tennessee. We're we're about 50 years behind New York City and those places. On, thank the Lord. Well, where was a difficult students? Caitlin Shipley, Tim Livingston, Alan and Cindy Mango, Bernice Williams, Crystal Hale, Aaron Fowler, Nate Melody, Emma, Carolyn, students and teachers, Mark and Ed Keys, Steve Gars, Cassie Powers. Joe and Misty Andrews, Larry Garst, Kathy Andrews, Trish Garst, Jenny, Jared and Rachel, Tara Churchwell, Rachel Heaton, Grandview School, Jerry Boyd, Debbie Harrell, Randy Cloyd, Barbara Briggs, Judy Vito, Brenda Dickey, the children and the parents of divorce, church visitors. We had some uh, again Sunday, just about every week. And and I, I like it when visitors come to the church and then they come back and just keep coming. That's a, that's a good thing. Pray for our VBS that we had that still the seeds would take root and grow. Tommy Moody. I talked to Miss Tommy today and she said, tell everybody that I love them and I miss them. And I would sure be there if I was able to. You pray for Miss Tommy. Personal witness, caregivers, Miss Woodruff, a personal decision, Larry, Peggy, Rosemary, Amy, Ricky, Ann Booker, Darwin Booker. Darwin's running his, uh, his uh, trailer out at the fair this week, and, and it's a man, that's a job out there in, in the heat, and, the, and he, he does a lot of it for charity. Mo much of what he sells, makes and sells out there goes for charity. So you remember him, and, and some of our guys are, are no doubt out there helping him. Pray for Barbara and Beverly and Jessica, Alan, Haley, Violet, Devin, Mike, Carrie, Danny Hicks, Mike Garst, Laureen Pruitt, Sharon Taylor, Zoe Carter, Mina Bethany, Candy and Bob Roberts, Judy Fleming, Herb Smith. Herb's one of the men that we take food to every month. We actually deliver to his house. Herb just turned 90. And uh, I talked to his son Saturday when I took the food by, and he said, pray for Dad that that now that he's reached that milestone, he doesn't give up. But I've known Herb for 40 or 50 years, I guess, and just always been a man that loved the Lord. You pray for Herb. Barbara Campbell, Kim Trent, Brooke Story, Brittany Williams, Baby Williams, Luke Ferguson, Steve Ferguson, Geraldine Dye, Taylor Lord, Randy and Myra, Ricky and Kathy, Rick and Angie, Anita and Anthony, Sora and Ezra, Josh and Megan, Casey and Rebecca, Tristan Bales, Elsley, Elsie and Brown Hensley, Jolene Garst, the Broyles family, Campbell family, 
Thelma Smith, Tiffany Morgan, Hunter Family, Marie Brown, Hartzell Sparks, Hunter Estep, Taylor Tester, Stuart Miller, Kenny Garland, Shannon Tino, Sandy Bird, Billy Cunningham, Peyton Toth, Jeff Toth, Patricia Mills, Susan Strayham, Judy Arthur, Wayne and AJ and Patsy, Stephen Lisa, Madison Ferguson, Heather Hughes, Kelsey and Chesney Hughes, Dalton Byrne, Beth and Keith Hulse, Jacob Murr, Michelle Simpson, Avery, Ava and Austin Ann, Charlie Harmon, Courtney and James Dean, Bethel Bible Study, Pauline Clark, Brenda Will and Chad, the Edwards family, our nation and troops, Ukraine, Israel, Nancy McCarver, Jerry Breedson, Justin and Grayson Wilcox, Peyton and Olivia Hulse, Jacob and Lincoln Schaefer, Jonathan and Kelly Tipton, Taylor and Maddie Allman, the Silvers family, Charlie and Brenda, Jacob and Maggie, Chelsea and Kylie, Sean, Lindsay and Ara, Rhonda Herman, Joe Peoples, Beverly Pelagi, Laurie Crane, Angie Welch and family, Lauren Kirby, Seth Ives, Rhonda and Tony, Dylan McCourty, Jesse Toms, Lisa Terrell, Susan Wampler, and Pastor and Miss Debbie. Miss Debbie's with us tonight. She's doing better after her surgery. We read off the name of Israel. Pray for Israel. If you if you keep up with the news, you know that our our current administration is on the verge of re-entering the uh, the nuclear deal with Iran that uh, President Trump pulled out of. You know, it's the deal that Mr. Obama made when he sent about a billion dollars cash over there in pallets and unloaded it on the runway for them to use in their terrorist operations. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, a man named Bennett, I, I, loved, I loved Netanyahu and I expect that he'll be back soon, but this, this current Prime Minister called the President of France, Macron, because they're in on all this negotiating and the deal making. And, and he told the president of France, Israel will do whatever it takes to keep Iran from becoming nuclear. And, and, that's, and that's basically a diplomatic way of saying, it doesn't matter what kind of deal you get, if you allow them a nuclear weapon, we have to take action. And of course they're right. And, and when they do, they'll win. They get into a war with Iran, they'll win. If they get into a war with Iran, then here comes Russia, here, here comes Syria, here comes uh, many of the Arab nations, and boy, we could be on the verge to the trumpet, to the shout that takes us out. And, and, uh, and the Middle East is about to become, I, I think I saw one commentator on TV said it's about to become a nuclear hotbed. And it seems crazy, but uh, hopefully folks know what they're doing. <laughs> you can always pray toward that end. Amen. You got any requests tonight, Kevin? Sue Alvis. Sue Marie Brown, I remember reading that name. Very, very serious. Is she an elderly lady, Miss Sandy? Chad? Alice McLaughlin. Clark Tish. Roof range. Russ Bryant family. Her last name's Riddle too, isn't it? Nope. Hot. Piece of hat. Uh, 
I got Lisa Riddle on the unspoken, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> I think she signed her slip, Lisa Riddle, for an unspoken one. She, she wants to go back. <laughs> Rob Thomas family. Tammy. Catherine Mirup, Mirup or something like that. Catherine has COVID. I, I wondered about her because Catherine did get a job but she said I negotiated with them, and I'm off Sundays and Wednesday nights. But but she wasn't here Sunday, and I wondered about. It. Is she is she real sick or just? I miss her being here. We missed her in her food work too because she's always here helping. We always pray for those around back. By the way, I got one that didn't make it into my stack. Stella France, Theta Kelsey, Ashley Chance, Elon Samuel. Pray for our services this Lord's Day. Uh, this this Sunday, Brother Jay, how, why do I keep forgetting his last name? Prater. This Sunday, Brother Jay Prater is going to preach for Sunday morning. And, and sometimes I hesitate to tell you that because some, some of our less spiritual people say, well, the preacher's not going to be here, so I'm not going to be there. That's the less spiritual people that say that, right? But uh, uh, Miss Debbie and I are going to our former church in Bluntville. Uh, they are celebrating their 40th anniversary. And uh, Brother Kevin Morris is the pastor there, but Kevin hadn't been able to even be at church in about two or three months now because of his cancer treatments. But he's going to make a video and uh, say a few things. And, and it's, it's, I think it's going to be a special day because I still remember the Sunday morning at that same church that Kevin got saved. And so he's going he's gonna, to, you know, uh, he wanted me to come back and, and be a part of their service, their 40th anniversary. So I'll be preaching for him, and we'll have a wonderful time and probably eat too much, and then I'll be back with you Sunday night. So it's those less spiritual people that say, well, it's those less spiritual people that say that. <laughs> you know, some people have the idea and say, well, preacher, if you're not going to be there, I I'm just not going to be there. And, they, and they've, they've got some misguided notion that that flatters me. That, that that makes me feel more like, a, man, I failed somewhere. If they think I'm the church and they're not going to be there if I'm not there, I've, I've let them down somewhere, so don't, don't do that. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you tonight for another privilege to be gathered together in your house. Thank you for those that are gathered here. Many brought their children, brought their young people so they can be taught and be trained and be instructed in the things of God, how, how needed that is today. Thank you for those men and women that are back even now working with those children and young folks. We pray you give them wisdom and discernment and the patience that they need, that, that you guide them from on high in dealing with those young folks. Thank you for those that are gathered here, and we pray now for every single name that was mentioned tonight, every need that was mentioned, even the unspoken request. We pray that you might accomplish your perfect will, that, that you might meet these folks at every one of them right at that place of need that, that they might understand and recognize there's a God in heaven that answers prayers and that cares about me and wants to come and help me and meet my needs. We pray especially for those that are lost. We pray that they might be made aware that the, the gospel might be made clear to them that they could understand and be saved. Families are grieving tonight over the loss of a loved one. Families are worried and concerned over sickness and over 
health reports and doctor's reports, and we pray that you might, as, as long as they know the Lord Jesus and the free pardon of sin, we pray that the peace of God that passes understanding fills their heart and life. We know the Bible says that that peace comes through belief and through faith. We pray that they might come to faith. We pray this Lord's Day that as the families of God gather together, that, that those that meet here, you'd be a blessing and that, and that the, the preacher might bring just exactly the word that you'd have him to bring and that the church that we'll gather with, that you'll give us a wonderful time of thanksgiving, a time of celebrating 40 years of God's faithfulness and that many people who've come through the church and been saved and called into ministry might gather together with us and celebrate, and we'll give you all the honor and all the praise for what you've done. Now, tonight, as we open our Bibles, open our hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit may teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to start in First Chronicles chapter 3. We did finish the book of the Revelation Sunday night after 52 weeks. We are in our 23rd week in our study of David, but uh, I, I feel certain it will not go 52 weeks. But if it does, that'll be all right. First Chronicles Chapter 3 is where we start, and we'll go to uh, the books of Samuel. First Chronicles chapter 3, let's begin reading in verse 1. Now these were the sons of David, which were born unto him in Hebron. The firstborn Amnon. That's important, isn't it? Among the Hebrews, the firstborn is important. That means a whole lot more in Bible times than it does today. Amnon's the firstborn. He was born of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. The second, Daniel, of Abigail, the Carmelitess. The third, Absalom, the son of Mecca, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. The fifth, Shephathia of Habitol, the sixth, Ithrim by Egla, his wife. These six were born unto David in Hebron. And there he reigned seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years. And these were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shimea and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon, four of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. If you're counting... Solomon is number 10. Solomon's the 10th son of King David. Ebar also, and Elishama, and Eliphalet, and Noga, and Nephig, and Japhia, and Elishama, and Eliada, and Eliphalet, nine. These were all the sons of David besides the sons of the concubines and Tamar, their sister. King David took a lot of wives, and he fathered a lot of children, mostly sons. Now, usually when a man that is a king has a son, his firstborn son is the Prince Charles of the family, right? He's the crown prince. That means he's elevated above any of the other sons because if anything happens to dad, he's king. That's why he's called the crown prince. In David's family, that would have been Amnon. He was head and shoulders above all the rest of them boys. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe that's why it was so easy for Amnon to entice a half-sister to come into his home and in his bedroom and take care of him. You remember that story? He feigned being sick. And, and Tamar, only sister listed here, right? All these boys and one little girl. And he's lusting after that one little girl. Of course, they've grown up and, and they're at least teenagers and, and Amnon's probably much older than Tamar. But that would explain how he could 
say to his dad, oh, dad, I'm sick, and, and I want little sister to come and take care of me. And dad said, well, you're the crown prince. You get just about anything you want in the kingdom. So he sends his little sister, and then Amnon raped her. And if that wasn't bad enough, he disgraced her by sending her away. Well, that sister, that one sister, Tamar, all these brothers, her full brother was Absalom. And since she's the only daughter in the whole family, at least as far as the record says, can you imagine 19 brothers and one little girl? She, she would have been spoiled. Man, you couldn't measure how spoiled that little girl would be, would you? How they must have doted on her and spoiled her, especially her big brother, Absalom. He's the big brother of the only little girl in the whole family. But Amnon, he's the crown prince. He lusted after her. He wanted her. He took her. He took away from her something she could never get back, and then he threw her out like trash. That's the spoiled, rotten little sister, especially the sister of Absalom. Well, crown prince or not, Absalom had blood in his eyes, and he planned his revenge. Whether he's the crown prince or the king, he's not doing that to my sister. He planned to take revenge on him. Second Samuel chapter 13, verse 32 says this, And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Didn't say anything good or bad, just avoided him. I suppose he thought, if I get close to him, I'll strangle the life out of him. So he didn't say anything. He just schemed. He concocted a scheme to get Amnon alone away from the king and the palace. They threw a big party. They had a sheep shearing, and, and that's like harvest time, and so they were celebrating. And, and they got Amnon to come, and they got him about half drunk. And Absalom said to his servants, now, fall on him and kill him. And they did. So Absalom conspired to murder the crown prince of the nation of Israel. This Absalom, he's, he's quite a character, but the, there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. From the list of David's son, Absalom was the third behind Amnon and Daniel. But as far as we know, Daniel's not mentioned again. It's assumed and, and believed by many Bible scholars he, he must have died uh, when he was a youngster. He must have died in infancy. And, and there must have been a high infant mortality rate in that time before all the medical technology that we have now. seems the Bible doesn't say anything else about this Daniel. So that means with Amnon out of the way, his murderer, Absalom, where does he stand now? next in line so there's more going on here than maybe him just taking revenge for his sister he's next in line for the throne immediately after Absalom murdered Amnon he fled to his grandfather's home now do you remember we read who his grandfather was in first chronicles Absalom the son of Micah the daughter of Talmai king of Geshur so his grandpa's a king. Geshur's a, uh, it's just a small kingdom, nothing to brag about. It's on the, on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee where the Golan Heights would be now, up in that area, maybe parts of Syria. But just about a day or two's walk maybe from Jerusalem. So when Absalom kills his brother, he doesn't go back to the palace. He goes to grandpa's. And he stays there. And, and David could have sinned for him and brought him to justice. I mean, that's a, a murder. That's a killing offense. The judgment for that is death, right? And David could have said, go get him and bring him back. We're going to see that justice is done. But when you're guilty of murder, and when you're guilty of conspiracy and, and of taking advantage of a woman who was married, when you're guilty of all that, it's pretty hard for you to hand out justice 
to you boys that are following in your own steps. So Absalom goes to Grandpa. He actually stays there for three years, living with the king in his kingdom. Now notice when, when Amnon was killed, we don't, read, we, we, we don't read that David mourned the death of Amnon, the crown prince, that David said, oh, Amnon, Amnon, oh, oh my son Amnon, I wish I could die in your place. David didn't do that, but he sure mourned the loss of Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 37, it says this, But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amidhud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. That's Absalom he's mourning for. Not the dead son, the living son. David mourned for him every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom. But he didn't <laughs> for three years. No contact at all. You might say Absalom is in self-exile. I'm not going to go home until I know it's all right. There's something here that's a little hard to understand. David is mourning more for his son that's still alive than he did for the son who died. What is, what is it about this Absalom? Well, I think the Bible gives us the answer. You know what Absalom was? He was a movie star. He was a celebrity. He was one of the elite. He's somebody that everybody knew and everybody loved, and he was famous throughout the land. Let me read you where the Bible says that, 2 Samuel chapter 14. But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. You talk about a handsome man. I mean, you take my face and put it on a Schwarzenegger, and it's about what you'd... <laughs> you'd have one handsome person, wouldn't you? But he was known for his beauty. Listen to this. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. This is a fine specimen of a man. And by the way, you remember it talks about his, he cut his hair just once a year. He had this long flowing hair that, that was probably the envy of every woman in the kingdom. Man, I wish I could grow beautiful hair like that. And people loved him. He was beautiful. And it says in 2 Samuel 15, 6, So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You see, Absalom is a celebrity that can do no wrong. And all the people love him, and he's been in exile now for three years. Well, after those three years and, and some work behind the scenes by Joab, David brings Absalom home. But David doesn't bring him to the king's palace. They still don't meet. Matter of fact, David set him up in a house. And he lived in the house separate from the father. And they've still never talked. They've, they've still never reconciled and don't see each other for two years. So five years, you might say, five years of banishment from the king. During that time, Absalom had three sons and one daughter. Guess what he named his daughter? Tamar. He did. And the Bible states specifically that his Tamar was a beauty. Well, of course she was because, you know, dad's such a beauty. That's, that's where we get beautiful kids from is handsome dads, right? <laughs> Amen. Finally, after two years, Absalom's getting a little impatient. After all, he is the crown prince now. He shouldn't be living in exile in a house right in the shadow of the king's palace. So he, uh, he says to Joab, who's, you know, like the five-star general in the administration, he says, you get me in to see Dad. And Joab said, well, the king, the king, has, to insta, the king has, to, has to initiate this. I can't just go and say, now listen, king, time for you to see that. I can't do that. And, and Joab wasn't really 
too anxious about doing that. And, and so, so it was about harvest time, and, and you've heard the story about where Absalom went and set the fields on fire of Joab. You know, we had a field of wheat or barley or something, so he set the field on fire and, and burned his crop down. And, and Joab came and said, what do you mean by this? And Absalom said, watch it now, I'm the crown prince. I could be your king someday. You tell my dad I want to see him. He got his attention by burning his crops, burning his fields down. Second Samuel chapter 14 says, Joab came to the king, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Finally, the prodigal's been reconciled. The family's back together. But this Absalom is so, who is so beautiful on the outside, inside is filled with anger and hatred and envy and revenge. It's like, it's like Jesus said, you're like a whited sepulcher. You're like a grave that's been painted and decorated and made all pretty, but inside are dead men's bones. Well, that's Absalom. And immediately upon regaining his status as the crown prince, he begins to campaign to steal the throne from his dad. During his time back with the family, he's learned something that greatly disturbed him. He's learned that David, the king, his dad, fully intends to make the son of Bathsheba, the next king. That's Solomon. He's number 10 down the list. How could he pass up the celebrity of Absalom, the beauty of popularity? How could he pass up Absalom and go down to number 10 and make him the king? And by the way, why would David do that? Why would he skip over all these other sons and say, I'm going to make Solomon king? And, and he told his mother and he told Nathan the prophet, says Solomon's going to be the next king. How could David do that? In, in First Chronicles, look in chapter 22. I think we can find out why David did that. First Chronicles chapter 22. First Chronicles chapter 22, notice verse 5. You remember the story, David wanted to build a temple and God said no. Verse 5, and David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. And the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David Prepared abundantly before his death. Well, David, you, you want to build a house and you're going to prepare for it, but won't Absalom build it? What's Solomon got to do with it? He's number 10. Verse 6, Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days he shall build a house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever it wasn't David's choice was it God said to David I will choose you're going to have a son his name will be Solomon I will give him rest and he will build my house well, it seems Absalom cares nothing for the word of the Lord. 
Don't tell me what God told you. Don't tell me that that's what God wants. I'm the crown prince. He just knows it's his turn. So he goes throughout the city of Jerusalem, flattering the people with his beauty and his charm. Look now in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And notice, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there's no man deputy of the king to hear thee. You see what he's doing? Man, the king's letting you down. Who's the king? His father, David. Man, you got a legitimate problem here, and the king hasn't even made arrangements to hear your case. Verse 4, Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So not only is he a beautiful man, now he's acting beautiful. And when they want to show obeisance to the crown prince, he says, oh, no. He says, he says I just love you as a brother. And boy, if I was king, things would be different around here. He's sowing seeds of sedition. This, this is a real insurrection. Look at verse 7 in verse 15. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I vowed unto the Lord in Hebrew. Now, the 40 years doesn't mean 40 years that he did this. It's likely a reference to the fact that there's been a monarchy in the nation of Israel for 40 years. And, and Absalom, his intention is, I'm going to be the third king. So he's scheming. Let me go to Hebron. What had happened in Hebron? That's where David was first crowned king, Right? After the death of Saul, David went to Hebron, and the nation of Judah made David king, and he ruled from Hebron for seven and a half years. So that's why Absalom picks Hebron. Let me go pay my vow that I bowed unto the Lord in Hebron. He's lying. Isn't that something to use God as your excuse? Isn't that something to say, I'm just going to serve the Lord. I just want to do what's right. Verse 8, For thy servant vowed a vow, while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with him went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called. And they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong. For the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest they overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. And the king went forth, and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. And the king went forth, and all the people with him, and tarried 
in a place that was far off. Absalom has conspired against the king. If his plan succeeds, he will take the throne and he will take the life of David. And all those other brothers, he will take the life of all of those brothers to make sure that there's no challenge to his right to the throne. When word comes to the king, he understands exactly what's going on. He knows his time is limited. He said, we've got to pack what we can carry on our back, and we've got to go. And they left the king's palace and went across the Kidron Valley and up over the Mount of Olives and down into the Judean wilderness and stayed in a far place. So Absalom rides into Jerusalem feeling good about his chances. But God intervenes and supplies him with some faulty counsel. Absalom thought that David's counselors were on his side and actually there was one that was remaining faithful to David and he wanted to leave and go with David and David said, no, you stay here. And perhaps God can use you to advise Absalom in a way that will make him make a mistake. And so he did. And he stayed there. He was a, <laughs> he, he was a, he was a, if Absalom's the king, he's now a treason, isn't he? That's all right because David's the rightful king. Well, Absalom, Absalom, because of the counsel that that counselor gives him, he doesn't immediately pursue David. Because David said when they left, if we don't go fast, he's going to overtake us and he'll kill us all. Well, according to the counsel, he delayed. And one of his counselors that was with Absalom said, go now, go now, David, if you'll round up the forces and go now, you'll catch them tired, you'll catch them spread out, you'll catch them not ready, and you can take the kingdom and it can be yours tonight. And David's counselor said, oh, wait a minute. You know your dad, Absalom, and you go after your dad tonight, and he's like a cornered bear. You don't want to go up against a cornered bear. You gather your truces and tr troops and you marshal your forces and you make your strategy. And then you go and boy, you'll find him and you won't have any trouble conquering him. And Absalom said that, or, or Absalom said that sounds like a good idea. And, and so he waited. And he convened his army and he struck out after David. And by this time, because of the delay, David and his men were ready. Second Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. And David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. You know why David could have hundreds and thousands? Because Absalom waited. Because God saw that he got faulty counsel. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth. For if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. <laughs> David wanted to march out in front of the battle. They said, no, sir. No, sir, we can't afford to lose you. And the king said unto them, what seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side, and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. What? David, if he catches you, he will kill you. He will kill your wives. He will kill your children. He will kill your administration. Take it easy on Absalom. Joab, try not to hurt the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain, before the servants of David, and there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. 
20,000 of Absalom's newly formed army killed. We don't read about a single casualty in David's army. And isn't that interesting? The woods devoured more people than the sword on that day. We sure know one that the woods devoured. That was Absalom. He's riding his mule through the woods and it doesn't specifically say that it was long flowing hair that got caught in a tree, but it said it was caught in a tree by his head. He may have rode under a tree and, and run his neck into a V branch and got stuck that way. It doesn't say, but it's, it's kind of fun to think about him, that long hair getting it hung in a tree and hanging there. And his mule takes off and leaves him hanging there. Joab comes upon him. Joab says to the nearest prophet, kill him. He said, no, sir. I heard what the king told you. Joab takes three arrows. Pew, 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 while he's hanging there in the tree by the hair of his head. Puts him to death. Messengers were sent to King David. Take David the good news. His kingdom has been saved. He can return to Jerusalem. Can you imagine being that messenger? You come, you come running up to King David and say, David, our side won. You're still king. But David is overcome with grief. Look at verse 32. David said, what about, what, about, what about the young man Absalom? The messenger said, may all your enemies be like Absalom. Dead. Verse 22 of chapter 18. Then said Ahimenez, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, Let me, I pray thee, run after Cush. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, seeing thou hast no tidings ready? He said, Let me run. And, he run. and they want to run a message to David. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate into the wall. And he looked, and he saw a man running. And the man came running. In verse 26, the watchman saw another man running. Verse 27, the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like that of Ahimenez. He's a good man, and he's got good news. And Ahimenez called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which have delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against the Lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and sent thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said, Turn aside. And he turned aside and stood still. The next runner, Cushy, came and said, Tidings, my lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against me. And the king said unto Cushy, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushy answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the son that just staged an insurrection and wanted to kill David and everybody else in the family. David seems more concerned about his well-being. He, he didn't ask the messenger, how many troops did we lose? How, how many men were slain on the battlefield today? He said, the son, the, the young man, how is he? How is he? Well, he's dead, David. Why did David react this way over the death of Absalom? And, and that's really the question that I wanted to try and answer tonight, and we're about out of time. You'll give me five more minutes, won't you? And, I, and I'll try to answer that. Even though David had given orders for him not to be harmed, we know something about Joab. Joab didn't believe in diplomacy. <laughs> This is not the first man he's murdered in cold blood. He was capable of that. And Joab said, I don't care what the king said. This guy tried to take the throne. He would have killed us all. Give me a bow and arrow. Give me a javelin. Give me a spear. 
he was a cold-blooded murderer. Maybe, maybe, maybe a long time before David should have drained the swamp, got rid of some of these kind of people that had their own private agenda rather than the king's. Absalom was buried in a pit and stones piled over him. That, that was an ancient custom. That's the way you dishonored rebels or criminals. You didn't give them a burial. You just threw them out in the field and covered them up with rocks. When David heard the news, his grief seemed uncontrollable. He was weeping and mourning and what should have been a day of great celebration, the people were People were confused. Didn't, didn't we win? Don't we get to live? Aren't we going back to the palace? Then, then why is the king mourning? And, and they, didn't, they didn't get to celebrate. And, and, and Joab, Joab went up to David and said, let me tell you something. Let me, let me talk frankly with you, O king. If you continue this, your people are going to consider today as a loss and you're going to still lose your kingdom even though Absalom is dead. And so David went out then and washed his face and cleaned up and said, Oh, good day, good day. Thank you. What a wonderful job we did fighting the battle. Good day. But why would David react this way to the death of this rebellious boy? Some would say, well, that's just the natural way you react when you lose a child. It breaks your heart, and, and, and that's true. But David had lost at least two sons previous to this. He'd lost the first son of Bathsheba. You know, he, he mourned for seven days while the baby was still alive. But, but after the baby died, he said, well, no use mourning now. I, I can't bring him back, but I'll go to where he is. He'd lost his son Amnon, and the Bible doesn't say that he mourned and mourned and grieved and grieved over Amnon, even though he was the crown prince. It says David wept sore, but you don't find the grief that's recorded here. But when Absalom died, David says, I wish I could have died in his place. I wish I'd have been the one that died. I think probably the only thing that could be worse than losing a child to death would be losing a child to hell. And as far as we can tell from the scriptures, I think David knew that Absalom had never accepted the faith of his father. He sure never showed any demonstration of that. So David had tried to keep him from harm. David had tried to keep him from being killed because as long as he's alive, there's still hope. As long as he's alive, maybe he'll come to faith. That's the best I can come up with of, of David's response to this. And David's mourning for his son was threatening to cost him his kingdom. Yeah, but didn't Absalom get what he deserved? Well, he did, but that doesn't make the pain any less for David, does it? We know that, that people that reject the Lord Jesus, they deserve to go to hell. We all deserve to go to hell, and, and unless we get saved and trust the Lord, we're going to hell. But if it's one of your loved ones that's never trusted Jesus and they die, you don't, say, you don't go to church and say, bless God, they got just what they deserved. You mourn over that. To David, it must have been an unending torment that one of his sons, after him being chosen by God and blessed by God and called a man after God's own heart, that one of his sons, it's possible that he died apart from the faith. Now, if I ever come upon a better explanation for that, I'll be sure and share it with you, but that's the best I got tonight. But I can see that in David. I can see a man that would love his children so much it would break his heart if they died outside the faith. There's a message in there somewhere for us, isn't there? 
Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for another privilege to study your word and go through the scriptures and try to understand the lessons you teach us from these Old Testament accounts of David and his sons and his wives and his kingdom. And once again tonight, we pray for every request that was made, every name that was mentioned. Meet those needs according to your perfect will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being in the Lord's house tonight.